Hey guys, so today I wanted to recommend to you this textbook by Sean M. Carroll called An Introduction to General Relativity, Space, Time, and Geometry. I cried reading chapter 3 of this textbook, alright? Now this textbook um, doesn't require too much of a background in math. You're going to need a background in calculus and a background in classical mechanics, so some calculus of variations. But normally when you learn general relativity, uh, perhaps through a bit uh, more rigorous framework such as this book, uh, The Physical and Mathematical Foundations of the Theory of Relativity by Romano and Fernari, um, you're going to need to know some differential geometry and some manifolds, right? However, this textbook here um, doesn't actually have too much of a prerequisite, okay? So it basically starts with the theory of special relativity and gets uses special relativity as a framework for developing um, tensor calculus and understanding tensors, and it's a very coordinate... Um, very calculation oriented and very physical intuition oriented um, behind how to manipulate tensors and how they transform. Then chapter two is about manifolds. So this is a review of manifolds. So you don't actually need uh, to know manifolds to study this textbook because it's covered here. Although I would recommend that you study manifolds from an outside source. Um, now chapter three here is, is, ch is curvature. This is the chapter that really moved me. And you can see that here we, we start with um, covariant derivatives, parallel transport, and geodesics. Um, and then we get to properties of geodesics, uh, the expanding universe revisited, the Riemann curvature tensor, this is critical here, the Riemann curvature tensor, properties of the Riemann tensor, symmetries and killing vectors, maxly, maximally symmetric spaces, and geodesic deviation. So it's funny because I had a professor who was, uh, I was doing a reading course um, actually with this textbook. I was doing a reading course with this textbook by De Carmo on Romanian geometry with a professor, a math professor. And he stated that the, um, these, uh, this single chapter alone, uh, this chapter three here on curvature, um, and he looked at these sections and he said that he had about five textbooks in his office that covered just the just this chapter three alone. So, so a lot of content is covered, but it's actually covered quite shockingly well. I mean, the intuition is, is really covered quite well. The calculations are given the tools and the machinery. All the equations are, are derived. So for example, some critical equations like the equations for the covariant derivatives and the geodesic equation. This is the equation for the Christoffel symbols. Um, all of these equations are actually derived. So they're not just handed to you. He provides proofs. They're not super rigorous from a mathematical standpoint, but they're certainly rigorous enough for a first treatment of the subject. So, I mean, it's definitely, it's not just like, uh, no, the, you're, you're, you know, it's not just throwing formulas at, at you. They, they are derived. All the formulas in here are derived. It's from a coordinate. Usually it's done in coordinates, okay? So this is kind of the, the physicist's um, method of proof is you prove a theorem to be true in coordinates, and then you use the tensorial invariance to show that it's therefore true um, in all, throughout the entire manifold because, um, because of the arbitrariness of the coordinates, okay? So this is a common technique that physicists use uh, where basically they don't prove things as a, from a general standpoint, they prove them in coordinates, which is probably how it should be done, or at least a lot of proofs should need to rely on this strategy. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of proofs need to look at coordinates. And then they use the tensorial property of the coordinates to generalize to an arbitrary um, to, 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 to generalize these for formulas in an arbitrary manner. Um, it's actually funny, there's a recipe provided in this textbook for creating physical laws or extending uh, the physical laws, which is basically you take the laws of classical mechanics, you quote unquote replace the partial derivatives with covariant derivatives, and get a tensorial equation, and then you generalize. Once you have a tensorial equation, you just assert this equation holds true everywhere. So obviously, this is very colloquial. I'm just kind of um, quoting from a textbook that I studied actually a couple years back. But um, yeah, this, re regardless of, of the mathematical rigor, I mean, people love to just make fun of physicists, but this is really really a good textbook and I think that even if you're a mathematician you would really benefit from taking a look at this textbook and you don't need too much background if you're not a mathematician and you're just a physics student you don't need a ton of math background to, to get through this chapter four we cover gravitation chapter five we look at the Schwarzschild solution okay so this is going to be the elementary description of black holes okay 
Um, basically, the short child metric, uh, it's, it's going to be this spherically, uses the spherical symmetry, assuming a spherically symmetric um, gravitational source, and then you're actually going to get a radius based on this description. Um, you're going to in locally um, satisf satisfy the laws of Newtonian gravity, but then, um, but then you actually get a radius uh, for which, um, for which you actually get a singularity and a black hole. Okay, so so the theory actually predicts the existence of black holes. It's just a natural result of the of the framework of the theory, is the prediction of the existence of black holes. And black holes are actually um, relatively simple objects to describe in this uh, theory of general relativity compared to other um, astronomical objects. So that's why you actually tend to study black holes first um, when you're learning general relativity. And then uh, we get into the black hole zoo here, more general black holes. So you start studying some really interesting stuff, um, rotating black holes, charged black holes, event horizons, killing horizons. Um, and then, uh, by the way, I, I took a course. So I, I, this, I, t I studied this book um, in conjunction with the graduate physics course in, our, in the department. Um, and I believe we covered through, uh, through chapter six, we definitely covered event horizons. Uh, I don't think we covered all of chapter six. Uh, and then we skipped, let's see. So yeah, we did not cover perturbation theory, unfortunately. I need to go back and read this chapter. And then, um, yeah, I think we covered we covered some cosmology and we ended it with chapter nine. And then chapter, I mean, sorry, we ended with chapter eight. Now chapter nine actually gets into some interesting stuff, some quantum field theory and curved space time. So for those of you who don't know, Quantum field theory, when you start learning quantum field theory, you need to know classical field theory and essentially the Lorenz um, symmetry, all the special relativity. So quantum field theory is built on this framework of special relativity. Of course, quantum field theory is trying to incorporate um, some relativistic effects into quantum mechanics, namely the, um, the constancy of the speed of light and the Lorenz symmetry of space-time or at least um, Minkowski space-time. And so the, the starting point for quantum field theory is an understanding of special relativity and, um, and classical field theory and special relativity. And then here we get a chapter on quantum field theory and curved space-time, which is not actually a fully developed theory because um, we can't actually fully do quantum field theory on uh, arbitrary curved space-times. It's one of the problems or one of the drawbacks of our current understanding. Okay, so... Where am I going with this? Well, even if you don't cover the whole textbook, read chapter three. And, you know, chapter one and two, if you haven't seen this stuff before, you can read them. Um, I, I don't recommend this as a rigorous understanding of manifolds. You might need to re, um, source chapter two from elsewhere, but it's a good, maybe a good um, start. This isn't how I learned manifolds, but you can start here and read this if you haven't seen manifolds before. This is a really good chapter. Chapter one, you're going to need to read um, as to prerequisite towards understanding the book and understanding the notation of the book and the tensorial notation that's being used, the Einstein summation convention, etc. So you're going to need chapter one. Chapter two, you can definitely read. If you um, under already know manifolds, you can kind of skip through this or you can read through it quickly, but it's still good to read just also for the notational convention. And then chapter three is what I'd really highlight here. So chapter three... Um, Chapter three is the pinnacle of the book, in my personal um, opinion. It is my favorite chapter. It covers so much material and does everything in with derivations. Of course, the derivations are in coordinate form, so they're not as um, they're not as mathematically pure as they could be, and that's where you'd have to reference a differential geometry textbook. Um, I would recommend Loring too for um, for additional. Um, information about um, about the Riemann curvature tensor, but everything's done rather rigorously here, um, albeit in coordinate form. And then you can skip forward to chapters four and five, and this would complete a full semester course if you really understood chapters four and five, especially chapter five. Chapter five is a great chapter for understanding how these ideas are actually applied in a very simple framework of the Schwarzschild metric. It's the most simple, like spherically symmetric metric that you're gonna get. And uh, you really get a full kind of um, treatment of all the ideas that are being built up in the previous chapters um, in this great example um, uh, from a physicist's perspective. And physicists are great at really complicated and um, illustrative examples. And so this is another excellent chapter, chapter five here. 
Um, and then I can't fully recommend the other chapters just because I haven't read them as in depth. I have read some of chapter six and it's very good. It's a little bit confusing. It's harder to get through. The material is a bit, uh, a bit, a bit harder to understand and comprehend, but there are some great diagrams um, and great, um, yeah, there are some great um, diagrammatic tools that are introduced, I believe in chapter six for understanding um, black holes and, um, and, but yeah, I, I would highly recommend up to chapter five. And um, yeah, this textbook, you know, normally I, I like to recommend math textbooks, but this is one of the textbooks that did change my life. I have to give credit to this textbook. It really changed the way that I see the world, changed the way that I see space time in general. Um, and, um, and I cried reading chapter three. So I, um, I would recommend it to all of you. Any of you are interested in gravity, interested in understanding the universe, or just want to understand a beautiful theory of math um, that gets used in physics. So pretty much most people, right? Uh, <laughs> I'd recommend this, this textbook.